Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. I'm Larry Swigart, co-author of Patriots History of the United States with Michael Allen. Now in its 41st printing and its uh, 15th anniversary edition is the most recent one, which is the one I will be reading from. <clears throat> As always, if you have an earlier edition, you're probably OK down to about 10 once you get before the 10th anniversary edition. Um, the headers are not the same. There's a lot of things that are not the same. Much of the content's the same, but we rearranged a lot since 2004. Uh, an update, I am going through the edits. Mike Allen looked at all of my new chapter and new editions for the 20th anniversary edition, which will be made free on the website sometime in the spring. And uh, I'm almost done with those. So that proceeds <clears throat> as they say, a pace. Uh, reminder, we have some great book offers coming up here on Black Friday. But in the meantime, we're going to already roll out some amazing ebook offers. And this includes, if I'm getting this right, uh, both edition, uh, both uh, volumes of Patriots History, the Mo Modern World in ebook form. That's one and two. My autobiography. Uh, American Entrepreneur, a book we've never offered before. It's my history of American business and my ebook, All Thumbs, my um, analysis of cell phones and the cell phone generation. And you get all four of those, uh, five of those, all five of those for $39. So take a look at the website, uh, look for that offer, but also look for some of the Black Friday offers of the physical books that come autographed because they're going to be exceptional. Also, a reminder, I will be at all five of the great homeschool conventions next year, and that's going to be um, Greenville, South Carolina, St. Louis, Missouri, Austin, Texas, Ontario, California, and uh, let's see, oh, Cincinnati, Ohio. I will also be doing the Florida Home Educators Association in Orlando, and I will also, I think, have a representative at a booth in Arizona for the Arizona Families for Home Education. So uh, seven conventions next year, be a pretty busy year. Uh, my newest book, Patriots History of Globalism, will be out. Uh, the date right now is February 20th, so be on the lookout for that from uh, Skyhorse Publishers. Uh, Steve Bannon's going to support that book, so it should uh, be very, very popular. All right, <clears throat> we started last time, I read the Missouri Compromise, and we started this section on the Missouri Compromise called the Fire Bell in the Night. I think this section of the book, if I had to point to any one section, even above and beyond the four pillars or above and beyond the revolution of the Constitution, I think this section of the book is the most important section when it comes to understanding two things. One, why slavery perpetuated itself for so long, because this is 1820, why it was so hard to get rid of. And second of all, how the modern political party system that was formed specifically to protect and preserve slavery. <laughs> Look at me, the Democrat party was formed for one reason only, to protect and preserve slavery. Electing Andrew Jackson is just a byproduct. If they could have done it with anybody else, William Crawford, Van Buren himself, anybody else, they would have, wouldn't have mattered because the goal of the party was to keep slavery from causing a civil war. That is, keep anybody from trying to eliminate slavery from causing a civil war. And so they did that by creating a new political party. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. That's what I, I'm going to cover here, but I cover it in even more detail <clears throat> in chapter one of my book, Seven Events That Made America, America. Um, it, it's called uh, Martin Van Buren Has a Nightmare and Creates the Modern Party System. So take a look at that. So let's get started here. I am on page uh, 207 at the very bottom full paragraph. Anticipating that eventuality. Well, let me back up so you know what the eventuality is. 
Moreover, free state population had already started to grow substantially faster than that of slave states. Missouri's statehood threatened to shift the balance <clears throat> of power in the Senate in the short term, but in the long term, it would likely set a precedent for the entire Louisiana Purchase Territory. So that's the eventuality. Anticipating that eventuality, and since Louisiana had already become a state in 1812, the South would try to further open Louisiana Purchase lands to slavery. Congressman James Talmadge of New York introduced an amendment to the statehood legislation <clears throat> that would have prevented further introduction of slaves into Missouri. Just you, you can keep the ones that are there now, but you can't bring any more in. A firestorm erupted. Senator Rufus King of New York claimed the Constitution empowered Congress to prohibit slavery in Missouri and to make prohibition a prerequisite for the admission to the Union. As a quick reference, his could be labeled the Congressional Authority View, which was quickly countered by Senator William Pinckney of Maryland, who articulated what might be called the Compact View, wherein he asserted that the United States <clears throat> was a collection of equal sovereignties and that Congress lacked the con constitutional authority over those sovereignties. Now, if you recall, I've been over the number of times that Jefferson said in the Declaration and what was said in the uh, preamble of the Constitution, that it is the people who are the generating energizing force in the United States. Jefferson never once said that the states were the ones doing the uh, declaring independence from England. And um, Madison never said, we the states. He said, we the people, we the people, we the people, the people, the people, the people. It's always the people. So this compact view, I think, has gotten uh, way too much favorable press. It has no basis in the Constitution or in the Declaration. It may have some in the Articles. However, the Articles were amended, just as the Constitution was amended with the Bill of Rights. So you can't say, well, you know, you you disregard the articles, you can't do that. Um, well, yes, we can, because we amended it, amended it by throwing it out, replacing it with the Constitution. The Constitution itself was amended, not just 10 times, but many more times over the years. Those are all finished, actual laws, done deal. So just kind of keep that in mind. Indeed, the Constitution said nothing about territories, much less slavery in the territories, and left it to statute law, which would be Congress, to provide guidance. That was the case with the Northwest Ordinance, which banned slavery. But since Louisiana Purchase is not a part of the United States in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance made no provision for slavery west of the Mississippi, necessitating some new measure. No sooner had the opposing positions been laid out than the Territory of Maine petitioned Congress for its admission to the Union as well, <clears throat> allowing for not only sectional balance, but also providing a resolution combining the Maine and Missouri applications, which in the long run was a mistake. Um, they should have hashed this out earlier. And if it came to a fight, they should have fought it out earlier. It would have been far less bloody and far less divisive. The end would have always been the same. A further compromise prohibited slavery north of the 36 degree 30 minute line. There is also more insidious clauses that prohibited free black migration in the territory and guaranteed that masters could take their slaves into free states which reaffirmed the state definitions of citizenship in the latter case and denied certain citizenship protections to free blacks in the former. So this will be the basis of the Dred Scott case later, namely that Dred Scott is taken as a slave into a free state and also onto federal territory, which was free, and he claimed his freedom on that basis. <clears throat> Packaging the entire group of bills together so that the Senate and House could, would have to vote on the entirety of the measure, preventing anti-slave Northerners from peeling off distasteful sections, was the brainchild of Henry Clay of Kentucky. 
more than any other person, Clay directed the passage of the Compromise and staked his claim to the title given him, the Great Compromiser. Some, perhaps including Clay, thought that, that with the passage of the Missouri Compromise, the question of slavery had been effectively dealt with. <clears throat> Others, however, including former President Thomas Jefferson, were deeply concerned. Jefferson said the news woke him like a fire bell in the night. Others were as disconcerted as the sage of Monticello, including Martin Van Buren of New York, who concluded just the opposite. The compromise set in motion a dynamic that he was convinced would end only in disunion or war. Van Buren consequently devised a solution to this eventuality. His brilliant but flawed plan rested on certain assumptions that we must examine. Southern prospects for perpetuating slavery depended on maintaining a grip on the levers of power at the federal level, but the South had already lost the House of Representatives and was losing it more with every new territory that joined. <clears throat> Southerners could count on the votes of enough border states to ensure that no abolition bill could be passed, but little else. Power in the Senate, meanwhile, had started to shift, and with each new state receiving two senators, it would only take a few more states from the northern section of the Louisiana Purchase to tilt the balance forever against the South in the upper chamber. That meant forcing a balance in the admission of all new states. So you got to make sure you got enough slave states to offset these free states. <clears throat> Finally, the South had to hold on to the presidency. This did not seem difficult, for it seemed highly likely that the South could continue to ensure the election of presidents who would support the legality, if not the morality, of slavery. But the courts troubled slave owners, especially when it came to retrieving runaways, which was nearly impossible. The best strategy for controlling the courts was to control the appointment of judges, through a pro-slavery president and Senate. Since the ability of the non-slave states to outvote the South and its border allies would only grow, hence Jefferson's observation that the compromise was a, quote, reprieve only, not a final sentence, anyone politically astute could foresee a time in the not too distant future when not only would both houses of Congress have northern anti-slave majorities, but the South would also lack the electoral clout to guarantee a pro-slavery president, and you could add courts. On top of these troublesome realities lay moral traps that the territories represented. Bluntly, if slavery was evil in the territories, was it not equally evil in the Carolinas? And if it was morally acceptable in Mississippi, why not Minnesota? This was a big problem for the South. These issues combined with the election of 1824 to lead to the creation of the modern two-party system and the founding of the Democratic Party. The father of the modern Democratic Party, without question, was Martin Van Buren, who'd come from the bucktail faction of the Republican Party in New York. As a son of a tavern owner from Kinderhook, New York, Van Buren was known as, quote, the little magician, and his political group was known as Old Kinderhook, which became the basis for our modern term, OK. If you were ever a member of the club, you were a member of OK. You were OK. Because of his father's middle class status, Van Buren resented the aristocratic landowning families and found enough otherwise other like minded politicians to control a New York State Constitutional Convention in 1821, enacting universal manhood slavery, uh, manhood suffrage. Sorry. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect of Van Buren. He personally had owned a slave. Uh, he was beque bequeathed a slave by his dad, but the slave ran away. Van Buren never sought to get him back. So technically he was a slave owner, but in his heart, he was anti-slave. And um, it reminds me of many people who today say they are pro-life, but they vote for um, pro-abortion politicians. Um, so, well, you know, I'm, I'm pro-life myself, well, but you don't show it in your vote. Well, the same thing with Van Buren. He was anti-slave, but he designs a system that keeps slavery in power for another 40 years. Um, he learned to employ newspapers as no other politician had, linking journalists' success. Um, let me see, back up. On a small scale, suffrage reflected the strategy 
Van Buren intended to see throughout the nation, an uprising against the privileged classes and a radical democratization of the political process. He learned to employ newspapers as no other political figure had, linking journalist success to the fortunes of the party. Above all, Van Buren perceived the necessity of discipline and organization, which he viewed as beneficial to the masses he sought to organize. <clears throat> Yet Van Buren personally embodied the contradictions the Democratic Party would soon exhibit, espousing lib liberty while protecting slavery. Van Buren had inherited a slave from his father. The slave ran off when he was a teenager, but developed a sharp distaste for the institution. While working local and state politics in New York, Van Buren hit upon a strategy he intended to use throughout the nation by focusing on suffrage, i.e. getting out the vote. This constituted an uprising against the privileged classes and a radical democratization of the, and up of the political process, yet one greased by the awards of party and government jobs. Um, what Van Buren was going to do was to reward those who got out the vote for the Democrat Party with party jobs. So you get out your precinct uh, to vote Democratic, and it turns out heavily Democratic, you can expect to get a job from Van Buren in the party. And if you do well in your next job, say getting out a broader swath of people, you can be promoted. So you see people start to get promoted through the party by their ability to turn out the votes. And eventually, when you get to the top of the party structure, you start to get government jobs at the state level. And then you start to get federal jobs. Um, Ron Brown, who was uh, Clinton's Secretary of Trans Transportation or Commerce, I forget which, uh, had been a Democrat committee chairman. Uh, he had worked his way up. So this was how you did it. You demonstrated your loyalty by getting out those votes and you got money. You got you were paid. So it's a bribery scheme, folks. So they were bribing people to get out the votes, whether or not it's very important whether or not you believed in slavery personally, whether or not you thought it was okay, moral or immoral, didn't matter. Your job was to get out the vote. And so you could say, well, I'm personally opposed to slavery and then go out and turn out the vote that would ensure slavery would stick around another two years, four years, six years. Okay. Uh, anyone politically astute could foresee time in the not-too-distant future when not only would both houses of Congress have northern anti-slave majorities, but the South would also lack the... Uh, oh, that's way up there. I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay, get out the vote. This constituted an uprising against the privileged classes and a radical democratization of the political process, yet one greased by the awards of party and government jobs. As one political opponent marveled of Van Buren's patronage network. Now, that's what it's called. When you give away job, it, jobs, it's called patronage or the spoils system. That is, you are the patron of all these people coming to do your bidding so they can get a job. <clears throat> As one political opponent marveled of Van Buren's patronage network in New York, quote, the wires of political machinery were attached to strings in every county. He learned to employ newspapers as no other political figure had, linking journalist success to the fortunes of the party. Guess what? I just found a duplicate sentence in here. We need to fix that. Hold on. Let me make a note to myself. Page 209. Did you catch that? I said that in paragraph two. Uh, line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, line fourteen. And then again here on the final paragraph. Line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11. Okay, there we go. Okay. Even while he took Van Buren, as, as Duff Green, one of the editor allies wrote, quote, party is everything. Even while he took Van Buren's money, 
Green recognized the danger of a politicized press, which is exactly what we have today, folks. Washington Post, New York Times, ABC, NBC, CNN, uh, MSNBC, Google, Twitter, less so at Twitter, Facebook, are all heavily, heavily, heavily Democratic, heavily Democratic. Uh, and they're all intermarried. And the reporters are all intermarried with people who are in government, um, in the FBI, in these various agencies, in Congress, in the Senate. So it's it's a terrible situation because we do not have a free and fair news whatsoever. <clears throat> As uh, Green said, quote, it is vain to talk of a free press when the favor of power is essential to the support of editors and the money of the people by passing through the hands of the executive is made to operate as a bribe against liberty. What did we see in 2020 with the, um, or rather 2017, I should say, with the Russia hoax? What we saw was the media colluding with the Democrat Party and these various investigators like Robert Mueller, as I call him, Mulehead, uh, to try and take down a sitting president with an absolute fake, phony, totally bogus Russian hoax. And very few of them admitted it. A Columbia Journalism Review admitted it. But I don't think the New York Times or the Washington Compost have ever admitted their role in, um, in the whole Russia pro, which was nothing but a lie, a giant, giant lie. And uh, we know that now, uh, but they haven't admitted it. And so Duff Green is pointing that out. He's saying, look, it's not a good situation to have editors owe their existence to a political party because they're going to have to say what that party wants them to say. And today in our time, it's worse because you can tell if you listen, and I know some of you kids aren't going to do this, but if you listen to some of the newscasts, they not only have the same story, they not only have the same take and the same spin on every story, they literally have the same exact wording. When And Rush Limbaugh, the great Rush Limbaugh, used to play these clips of all these people saying exactly the same thing all across the country. Why? They got memos from the Democrat National Committee telling them exactly what they were to say about this, that, or the other issue. Duff Green. 1826 said, that's bad. I'm a Democrat, but that's bad. Above all, Van Buren perceived the necessity of discipline and organization, which he viewed as beneficial to the masses he sought to organize. With his allies in the printing business, Van Buren's party covered the state with handbills, posters, editorials, and even ballots. And by the way, I just found a second sentence that was absolutely repeated verbatim. Uh, I don't know how all of us missed those. Nobody else had brought those to our attention, but I caught them now. So they won't be in the next edition or printing. They won't be in the next printing. All right, page 210. Van Buren's plan also took into account the liberalization of voting requirements in the states. By 1820, most states had abandoned property requirements for voting, greatly increasing the electorate and contrary to expectations, voter participation fell. You get it? The more widespread access to voting became, the less partic participation there was for a very, very long time. Maybe that has changed recently. We don't know because there are these questions of fraud out there. Supposedly, voter participation in 2020 was the highest ever. I think the number I heard was 91 percent. I don't believe that for a minute. I, I think that the fraud level may have been 91%, but the voter participation level probably wasn't any greater than any time before. But the more you gave out the franchise or the right to vote, the more likely it was voter participation would go down because many people don't value the franchise. By 1820, most states had abandoned property requirements for voting and greatly increasing the electorate and contrary to expectation, voter participation fell. In fact, when property restrictions were in place, voter participation was the highest in American history, again, up to this recent questionable election. More than 70% participation in Mississippi in 1823 and Missouri 1820, more than 80% in Delaware in 1804 and New Hampshire 1814 and an incredible 97% 
of those eligible voting in 1819. I think that was in Alabama. The key to getting out the vote in the new larger but less vested electorate was a hotly contested election, especially where parties were most evenly balanced. There occurred, quote, the highest voter turnout with spectacular increases in Maine, New Hampshire, the Middle States, Kentucky, and Ohio. Those would be kind of right on the border. Or put another way, a good old fashioned partisanship of the type Madison had extolled energized the electorate. In other words, it turns out when you have your most partisan divides, that's when people go to the polls and vote. If, if everybody's in the soft, mushy middle, why vote? You're going to get the, kind of the same thing, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. <clears throat> Van Buren absorbed the impact of these changes. He relished confrontation. Known as the Little Magician of the Red Fox at Kinderhook, Van Buren organized a group of party leaders in New York referred to as the Albany Regency to direct a national campaign. Whereas some scholars make it appear that Van Buren only formed the new party in reaction to what he saw as John Quincy Adams' outright theft of the 1824 election, he had, in fact, already put the machinery in motion for much different reasons. For one thing, he disliked what today would be called the new tone in Washington, Monroe's willingness to appoint former Federalists to government positions, or a practice called the Monroe Heresy. Uh, today, we kind of call it the uniparty or reach across the aisle. Van Buren hated that. The new, new Yorker wanted conflict, and he wanted it hot as a means to exclude the hated Federalists from power. Um, the election of 1824 is best provided as a stimulant for the core ideas for future action already formed in Van Buren's brain. Now, uh, I'm going to stop here, but uh, one last note on this. Um it's interesting that uh, when you have these very hotly contested elections, people turn out because why? The issues are crystal clear. Um, the issues can be muddy if, if you don't have a hotly contested election, if everybody's kind of going along to get along. Um, why bother to turn out? So um, <clears throat> one of the things that has been advocated uh, in recent years, probably going back 10 or 12 years, was was a, a newer, more gentle tone in Washington. Baloney. We don't need a gentler tone. We need the two parties to go at it, hammer and tong, so you figure out who stands for what. If they're able to mush their way along and, you know, I agree with my colleague across the aisle, we don't want everybody agreeing because we do not have the same goals and ideals. And one side needs to win. That's the only way you get progress is for one side or the other to win. Um, so uh, that's, I mean, look at what happened when they were kind of going along to get along. We had slavery and, and it took a real conflict. Unfortunately, it took war because they wouldn't have a real conflict about it before that time. Um, so this, this kind of reach across the aisle stuff is way overblown. We, we need uh, more contention, not less, because when there is more contention, people's minds get uh, innervated or, or um, excited. They, they kind of get uh, drawn in. They say, oh, wait. This is important after all. You don't want people thinking what they're doing in Washington is unimportant. It's critically important. So next time we're going to pick up with how Van Buren fleshed out this whole system. And it, it's pretty amazing. And what he gave us was not very good in the long run. Now, remember, we're trying to turn Patriot's history into a video, a film, a feature film. My screenwriter is almost done. He called me a couple of days ago and said, I'll probably have it to you next week. We, we're going to then move on to actually funding the two scene pilot It'll be about 20 minutes. We have to actually make 20 minutes of a movie. I need your help. Jump in, buy me a coffee, buy me 10 coffees. We really need your support. A lot of people sit out there and whine all the time about Hollywood. Well, Hollywood doesn't turn out anything I want to see. Oh, it's all it's all foul mouth stuff. It's all garbage. We're ready to turn out something that's going to be great and evergreen and lasting for a century, but we need some help. So get behind us. And I will see you guys back here on Monday.